It is now my pleasure to, uh, to introduce Lee. Um, and uh, even a stranger in this room would only have had to watch the interaction before we started to know that probably almost everyone in this room has some strong personal or professional tie uh, to Lee Shore. She is one of those beacons in our professional lives that we all rely on. Uh, we at the Center have the pleasure of working with Lee as a senior fellow at the Center. I tease her that every time I say that, my chest swells just a little bit, uh, but it, it happens to be true. Um, she's also part of uh, many of the organizations here. She's on the executive committee of the Aspen Roundtable for Community Change. She is on the board of the Seed Foundation. And if you look at the bio in your packet, it goes on and on and on. Um, I still run into people who say Lee's first book, Within Our Reach, changed my professional life. It changed the way I do business. Um, and there aren't too many of us, I think all of us would be happy to have that, there aren't too many of us who have left that kind of legacy and are still leaving a legacy. Um, I've had the pleasure of writing with Lee in the last several months and I can vouch for a couple of things. <laughs> several covers a wide range in my vocabulary. Uh, I could vouch for a couple of things. One that surprised me uh, was that um, she, I think in this room, with the possible exception of Ralph Smith, would hold the title for the um, most emails after the hour of 11.30 at night, and hers are infinitely more coherent than Ralph's. So. <laughs> <laughs> so as, as someone who is an absolute uh, treasure as a colleague and as a friend and as a source of knowledge and inspiration for us all, um, it's a pleasure to introduce Lee Shore. What a great pleasure it is to be here. Uh, in the midst of this extraordinary gathering, which so many of us have been looking forward to for so long. Um, I want to say a word in addition to what Frank has already said about the background of Frank's and my paper, which is what I will be drawing on for this keynote. Uh, several, of, several of us at the Center for the Study of Social Policy have been honored to work with members of the administration and with states and communities on several path-breaking initiatives that the uh, administration has advanced over the last two and a half years, and on a number of philanthropic initiatives, all aimed at the ambitious goals that we share to radically improve the lives of children and families. Uh, and the neighborhoods that the disadvantaged children and families live in. I myself have been particularly fascinated by the issues around evidence and evaluation that have been raised by these initiatives, especially in the context of exploring how the balance between minimizing the risk of failure on the one hand and encouraging more effective and innovative solutions on the other might evolve in the years ahead of us. Um, as I got e deeper into the issues, I realized I needed help. And fortunately, I was able to persuade Frank Farrow to join me in writing the paper. Actually, um, it's only six months that we've been collaborating, not the whole nine months. but. Frank's interests in maximizing learning and gaining real-time feedback stemming from the complex initiatives that he has headed and has shaped uh, so elegantly complemented my interests and experience. And while Frank and I still have some subtle differences in emphasis, our collaboration was really a labor of love because uh, we hoped it would provide a solid basis for discussion of some very serious, important issues. 
and because it would kick off this first Harold Richmond Forum and because we both loved Harold. Now, our basic thesis, let's see, they don't have a place where you can put your watch, so somebody will have to raise their hand if I'm, you let me know if I'm going over 35 minutes, okay? Um, our basis, basic thesis is that thanks to the last two decades of research and experience, we know so much more than we ever did before about what it takes to improve outcomes for disadvantaged kids and families, whether you measure it in healthy births, school readiness, school achievement, physical and mental health, neighborhood support and safety. But our expanded knowledge has not led to better outcomes at a magnitude that really matches the need. The reasons include persistent poverty, failing institutions, mismatch between skills and workforce demands, a weak economy, distrust of government, and need I say it, severe budget constraints. But there's another reason for the gap between knowledge and accomplishment. In our efforts to solve complex problems, we've too often failed to marshal the full extent of available evidence and to generate new real-time knowledge from experience. This reason is unlike the others in that the levers of change are much more visible and they're within the reach of a lot of the people in this room. We can do something about broadening the framework for what we consider credible evidence. We can alter the disproportionate focus on evidence that's generated from experiments and from just one type of solution, programmatic interventions. We can expand the methods we use to learn in real time from innovative and complex approaches to solving longstanding problems. We can make better use of accumulated knowledge and experience to figure out how we scale up what works. Attempts to reach scale so often focus simplistically on replicating isolated program models that don't take on the larger challenges of identifying the core characteristics, not only of programs, but also of systems and environments that are essential to transformative change. We believe that the large scale improvements for the children and families most at risk of long term damage require a more inclusive approach to how we define, collect, assess, and use evidence. Our commitment to ensuring that practice, policies, and strategies that are publicly or philanthropically funded will be evidence based or evidence informed must not diminish. Let me say it again. There can be no retreat from assuring that our practices, policies, and strategies will be evidence-based or evidence-informed. But our definition of what counts as credible evidence in judging what's worth funding or scaling up or learning about systematically, that has to be expanded to allow for and encourage continuing improvement and innovation. We think that this is the time to reassess what constitutes credible evidence to, bring us, to build a stronger knowledge base. The stakes have never been higher. On the one hand, we have to be more prudent than ever in our investments. At the same time, we have to seize on the Obama administration's full awareness of unsolved social problems and its ambition to tackle them. Now, this may be a, like, seem like a very strange moment to set out an agenda for how to do better with the nation's social programs and policies. After all, this week, the only people who are talking about anything other than the coming Armageddon are in this room. <laughs> but maybe this too shall pass. And we do believe that when times are tough and resources as well as faith in our institutions are in short supply, we have to be more thoughtful than ever about how and where to invest public and philanthropic dollars. I began the work on this paper when we were becoming increasingly involved with four administration initiatives, the Social Innovation Fund, 
the home visiting program under the health reform legislation, investing in innovation fund and promised neighborhoods in the Department of Education. These initiatives were remarkable in part because of the innovative ways that they were allocating federal resources. Agencies that traditionally distributed funds through formulas were using competitive processes, were encouraging partnerships with the philanthropic sector. Their use of an evidence framework was a significant innovation in itself. These initiatives also seem to raise most poignantly the questions of what should be considered credible evidence. Some of the tensions between taking risks with innovation, minimizing risk by relying on what's already proven, may be on their way to being resolved and will be resolved in the future with a more inclusive approach to what counts as evidence. Evidence-based does not have to mean experimental-based. When we draw on evidence from many kinds of research, not just program evaluations, and from theory and from practice, in even innovations can be evidence-based. A commitment to assembling and using broader and richer information about complex interventions is not a retreat to fads or hunches or anecdotes or good intentions, nor can it become the cover for a reluctance to identify efforts that are ineffective. But it does mean that rapidly moving changes in the economic and fiscal landscape, on the frontiers of research in human development and human brain development, and in what we're learning about the needs of the families, neighborhoods, and institutions that have been left behind, require us to approach change in bold new ways. Uh, Peter, Ruck, Peter Drucker once pointed out, the greatest danger in times of turbulence is not the turbulence, it is to act with yesterday's knowledge. In our paper, we propose five sets of concrete actions that the public, philanthropic, nonprofit, academic, business, and entrepreneurial sectors can take to move us away from yesterday's lo logic and toward a richer, more useful way to allocate resources, formulate policies, and designing and assessing interventions. We're under no illusions that these ideas will be brand new, but we're hoping that putting them together in one place will be useful in focusing the discussion. We're aware that many people in this room have already taken the lead in formulating and acting on some of these ideas. Otherwise, Frank and I might never have thought of them. <laughs> but for the purpose of our discussion, let me touch on a few highlights from the paper. First, we advocate doing more to combine findings from research, theory, practice, and evaluation. The idea that our knowledge about what works should come primarily from evaluations of a relatively small number of flagship programs doesn't take us far enough. We've learned much from the proven programs that exist today, and they can be the start of a knowledge base, but not the final destination. Even when scaled up, these programs can't achieve the magnitude of impact needed to change outcomes for the most disadvantaged children, families, and neighborhoods. Rather than, find, than the findings, rather, the findings from evaluation have to be combined with findings from other research, theory, and practice. In your folders, you have a handout, which is as far as we got with PowerPoint, just one. Uh, but it's an attempt to show how findings from program evaluation, which may be experimental, uh, results-oriented, multiple ways of evaluation, formative evaluation, can be combined with other research, theory, practice, and then synthesized in order to inform and guide policymaking. I want to illustrate this point about not getting stuck with just program evaluations. 
with a concrete example of a highly successful proven intervention, the Nurse Family Partnership Home Visiting Program, which is probably known to most of you. It's a remarkable case of a multi-part intervention that developed a model that was sufficiently standardized that it was possible to run randomized trials in three different sites, each with different demographics. NFP is now operating effectively in th more, almost 400 counties around the United States, fielding nurses to make home visits to low-income teenagers pregnant with their first child until the baby is two. The first randomized trial began three decades ago in Elmira, New York. I wrote about it in my first book. The second in Memphis, Tennessee, 23 years ago, and the last one in Denver, Colorado, beginning 17 years ago. And both children and mothers have been followed over the long run. The results were that in all three trials, nurse visited women had longer intervals between the births of their first and second children. In two of the three trials, there were reductions in child abuse and in healthcare encounters for children's injuries. Among the subset of children born to what were called low resource mothers, there were improvements in language development and academic test scores. There were a number of results looked for but not found in any of the sites. No reduction in behavior problems or foster care parents placements among the children. And among the mothers, there was no reduction in substance abuse, psychological distress, arrests or incarceration, and no greater educational achievement. But still, because the results that were achieved came out of randomized trials, the Nurse Family Partnership was the only early childhood program that qualified for a top tier rating by the Coalition for Evidence-Based Policy. Now, when substantial funds were to be allocated to home visiting under the health reform legislation, the initial administration proposal, which has since been modified, were that they be, and they were modified, where is Deb Darrow? One of the reasons they were modified is because of a memo that Deb Darrow and three of her colleagues wrote. Um, but the initial proposal was that these funds be limited to replication of the NFP model. That was pr primarily because the one consistent experimental result, the longer intervals between the first and second births among the nurse visited women, translated into such clear monetary savings. And that really impressed OMB. So what's wrong with this picture? We're dealing with a model that was designed 34 years ago, frozen in time in order to be considered a proven program that when replicated with full fidelity to the model will achieve the same results. The price for being rated a top tier proven program has been to keep that program constant rather than building on it to take into account new findings from research. Given what we now know, most of us would be inclined to make some changes. You might change the model's intake requirements that exclude mothers who receive no prenatal care so as to reach more high-risk babies, including infants in the foster care system, who are eight times more likely than other infants to be born to mothers who receive no prenatal care. You might adapt your design to partner with programs that have worked successfully with new parents who are depressed or abusing drugs and alcohol. Now that we know that toxic stress in early childhood damages specific circuits in the brain, leading to lifelong problems in learning behavior and health, and that the two most common precipitants of that toxic stress are parental substance abuse and postpartum depression, which NFP has not been able to affect. And having learned of the importance of enhancing the capacities of all the adults that care for young children outside their homes, you might extend home visiting services to family, friend, and neighbor care. Uh, and it's those family, friend, and neighbor caregivers who care for 41% of low-income children under age five with employed mothers. Now, when I talked about these issues at a meeting uh, a couple of months ago of the uh, Grantmakers for Effective Organization, a woman came up to me afterwards and said, you know, 
we're doing exactly, our United Way in our community did exactly what you said in terms of adding to the home visiting program of NFP, uh, except we added two more features. We also added a housing specialist and we added service to families involved with domestic violence. We were subsequently told, she said, that because of the additions we had made, we couldn't call ourselves an NFP program or a proven program of any kind, and we fear we may not be eligible for the new home visiting funds as a result. Now that story is one of many that illuminate the opportunities that we miss when we regard successful programs as arrival programs. Uh, arrival points instead of launch pads. Our second set of proposals is to become more strategic to support successful implementation and scale up. By looking at effective programs and strategies, not just individually, but also in clusters with similar goals, we can identify the common elements that contribute to success. These may turn out to be even more useful in helping communities know what to do as they adapt elements of proven programs to complex and evolving situations. Knowing the common factors of what works to achieve specified results would enable providers and funders and community leaders to improve on past practices and to engage in con continuing cycles of innovating, testing, retesting, reassessing, to make sure that implementation is optimal and that outcomes are achieved in the face of changing client characteristics and evolving social and, and economic environments and new learning. Syntheses of knowledge about what has worked and how will help to make interventions more effective and implementation stronger and will expand opportunities for successful scale-up. The next generation of efforts to achieve transformative outcomes is likely to involve not only replication of individual model programs, but also the more difficult task of identifying the powerful practices that emerge from analyses across programs that transfer more easily than do model programs. But um, this is something that Carol Emig has pointed out in a child trans paper that I think was very important on this subject. But we also need to use new knowledge from research and experience to improve and build on promising programs using strategies that effectively target outcomes that no single organization or program can achieve on its own. This means adding missing pieces, combining and connecting them to each other into systems that will support and sustain them. And will connect them to an infrastructure for change with the capacity to monitor and continually improve them. As an example, when a wide-ranging household survey conducted by the Harlem Children's Zone found that a third of the tested neighborhood children under 13 had asthma, more than five times the national average, HCZ enlisted a wide range of partners Harlem Hospital provided the medical knowledge and medical care, including trained health staff that made home visits. The Columbia School of Public Health supported data collection and evaluation. New York City Department of Health and the Columbia Urban Planning Program offered technical assistance on the environmental aspects. New York Legal Services gave legal assistance. And HCZ, with its deep ties to the community, reached out to neighborhood families who trusted HCZ enough to act on the advice that they got uh, from trusted people that they knew about what to do at home to reduce the incidence and severity of their children's asthma. The results were documented in dramatically decreased hospitalizations, emergency room visits, and school absences. Now these wicked problems that face us today tend to be caused by such complex forces that their course can only rarely be changed with isolated interventions. They require multiple stakeholders working together, often over many years, 
with a shared commitment to common results so that the resources and authority necessary to bring about the needed changes can be mobilized and successfully applied. John Kenya and Mark Kramer, in a quite celebrated piece in the Stanford Social Innovation Review, point out that so many funders and nonprofits overlook the potential for what they call collective impact because, and I quote, they are used to focusing on independent action as the primary vehicle for social change. Our third uh, uh, set of recommendations is to adopt a more pragmatic approach to assessing complex interventions. As we look toward the next generation of complex interventions, we need solid, credible, and deep evidence about what works. That means devising more diverse ways of locating, assembling, and evaluating rigorous evidence. But I know that the idea of a more pragmatic approach, and even that term, makes a lot of people nervous. Uh, especially people who yearn to rely on the proof that comes out of incontrovertible numbers. Being able to pick social interventions that have been scientifically proven to work, rather than having to make fall fallible judgments, has been more than reassuring. Economist Rob Hollister likes to say, randomized clinical trials are like the nectar of the gods. Once you've had a taste of the pure stuff, it's hard to settle for flawed alternatives. True, quite true. On the other hand, as Don Berwick, the crusading physician who now heads the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services has written, the randomized clinical trial is a powerful, perhaps unequaled research design, but only to explore the efficacy of selected components of practice. Drugs, procedures, other inventions that are conceptually neat and have a linear, linear tightly coupled causal relationship to the outcome of interest. Now, some programs that are complex but have been carefully standardized, like the Nurse Family Partnership or multisystemic therapy, have indeed been evaluated with experimental methods, but at the cost, as we've suggested, of having to be held constant. As a report on the Education Department's I-3 program that was just released by the Bellwether Education Partners pointed out, the more narrow the evidence framework, the more li likely it will skew the competition in favor of ideas that have been around long enough and had enough financial backing to make the experimental evaluations possible. And the competition, they might have added, will be skewed against the interventions that reach across multiple sectors and many levels and evolve over time and from one site to another. But even when causal connections are difficult to establish, we have to be able to assess effectiveness. That means accepting the value of many kinds of interventions that can be assessed, weighed, understood, and acted upon without having to be proven. A pragmatic approach to evaluation will, reach, will yield richer and reliable, if less certain knowledge, by beginning with the ends in mind, using strong theory to connect activities to results, comparing results even when it's not possible to find a perfect comparison group, using multiple methods of evaluation, and using experimental methods to determine with certainty whether or not a defined program is achieving desired results, and using non-experimental methods to assess and understand whether, how, and why an intervention achieved the resire, desired results when the causal connections are diffuse. We recognize that pragmatic approaches to evaluation would trade the advantages that come with certainty for the advantage of gaining more usable knowledge about interventions that are complex and evolving. This is a trade-off worth making in many, but of course not all, 
instances, a major argument for randomized experiments has been to provide a solid foundation for cost-benefit analysis. Where enough is known about costs and benefits, cost-benefit calculations are an important decision-making tool, one that we may want to come back to in the discussion. The key is that neither policy nor practice should be driven by evaluation methods. Instead, evaluation should be driven by policy and practice needs. Research methods should match the policy and practice questions to which we need answers and the nature of the interventions we need to learn about. Our fourth set of recommendations is that we create an expanded learning framework and manage to results. A lot of useful learning can be generated from complex interventions as part of day-to-day -day management. Within a results framework, it's possible to track progress toward those results and to use the data for real-time learning to continuously shape and drive the world work. You know, drive the world, too. <laughs> uh, the process of managing to results can be particularly valuable when it's adopted by many partners and adhered to across multiple sy systems, because it has the potential to focus the commitments of multiple partners around a common set of results, to track progress toward multi-year goals, in meaningful increments, help managers keep multi-pronged efforts on track, generate the news about achievement that can inspire and motivate all stakeholders, provide the learning about what works today in this community to change results, and provide essential information about initiatives that can't be assessed experimentally. And I want to add just a footnote to that about what can't be ex assessed experimentally. We have to stop assuming that anything that can't be assessed experimentally today can be assessed experimentally tomorrow. Uh, that's only true of efforts that are too small or too new to assess experimentally. It's not true of those that can't be evaluated experimentally because they're too complex, evolving, and require collective action to achieve results. I want to illustrate my point about why simple, straightforward measures of performance, which are often undervalued, can sometimes provide uniquely useful information. I know an organization that I don't want to identify because this information came to me confidentially which provides multifaceted supports to children and youth who are at extremely high risk at six different sites. It records performance data on results, and despite its seriously disadvantaged population, it's documented the high school graduation rate of its participants is 15% higher than the national average. 99% of its participants have avoided early parenting. And although three-fifths of the participants have an incarcerated parent, 95% have avoided involvement with the juvenile justice system. A foundation-funded eight-year eight year randomized evaluation study is now underway using a sample of children from each of the six sites. Last year, as a result of the recession, one of the sites uh, had a terrible, terrible, down, uh, ter terrible loss of funding. And its board agreed that in order to stay in business, they would change the intervention. They would use volunteers where previously they had used professionals. I heard this story and sympathizing with the staff's concern that this would weaken the evaluation, but I suggested that they would now learn a lot about the difference that their original intervention made compared to the modified intervention. The CEO said they wouldn't learn that because the evaluators had told them that the N in that site would be too small to learn anything reliable. Now, this agency is already counting the number of their participants who are being promoted from grade to grade, 
whose school attendance in reading and math scores is going up or down, numbers who are staying out of the juvenile justice system, avoiding teen parenthood, but because they somehow had been persuaded that nothing worth knowing is, nothing is worth knowing unless you know it for certain, they'd been dissuaded from making judgments about how the outcomes of this year's intervention compared to the outcomes of last year's. Um, this strikes me as a perfect example of the idea that the late MIT organizational theorist Don Schoen described as epistemological nihilism in public affairs, the view that nothing can be known because the, dis because the certainty we demand is not available. Uh, and our last set of recommendations has to do with strengthening measurement for accountability and learning. The paucity of good measurement tools is a formidable barrier to maintaining accountability, managing by results, continuously improving quality, and assessing impact in complex initiatives. If high quality, widely accepted, readily understood, and reliable measures and indicators are to be available where they are most needed, philanthropy and the public sector must invest in assuring that local community efforts will have access to appropriate data sources, indicators, and measures. This will require support in the development of appropriate and comparable measures for small geographic units, metrics to, cover, to capture all critical areas of work, striving for as much clarity about what to measure as about how to measure, appropriate interim measures, and that has to be accompanied with a lot of help to political leaders and to some funders to understand why they should care about incremental signs of progress that predict long-term results. And lastly, has to also support capacity among stakeholders to work with shared results, accountability, and shared measurement frameworks. I just want to conclude by saying that the current controversy about criteria for credible evidence is not trivial. How we as a nation deal with issues of evidence will shape the nature of social innovation, of programs and policies, what is and what is not allowed, provo promoted and incentivized for years to come. Too much potential for innovation and for improved outcomes will be lost if we continue to define credible evidence too narrowly. Rather, we have to make use of all the evidence we now have from multiple sources, and we have to aggressively gather new evidence about the nuanced and powerful strategies that are currently emerging. So that a more inclusive approach to evidence will take root and flourish we call on public and private funders to take the lead in what initial in individual initiatives cannot do on their own by encouraging and supporting knowledge collection, analyses, and syntheses that yield a more complete body of evidence, by working with the evaluation community to expand the menu of available evaluative techniques that can be matched to different types of interventions and different needs to know and by supporting the development of the tools and capacities that will ensure that federal, state, and community level initiatives can generate rigorous new knowledge at greater scale. Now, Frank and I hope that our paper contributes some ideas to the discussion and moves us toward common ground on all the ways we can use today's ever-expanding knowledge and continue to generate more in the interest of combating poverty, inadequate education, social isolation, joblessness, and years of disinvestment in low-income communities. These are the missions we all share and that we wish Harold Richmond were here to help us accomplish. With that thought, I conclude. I, I, I have one thing that I'd like to ask, Lee, if you don't mind. One of the things that I noticed that you said at several points that 
I don't hear in the paper so much, is the issue about the distrust of government and the distrust of people who represent the government and what impact that has on the conversation that we're having. Do you want to say a little bit more about that? I think it makes everything we're talking about harder. Well, it makes everything harder. I mean, it makes it harder to get a, uh, a debt limit bill passed. Distrust is at the bottom of that. And uh, it makes it harder to accept as true or meaningful anything that is not totally produced by the numbers. Um, the, um, I heard somebody in the administration say that only random assignment clinical experiments are, I guess I can't say that word, but they are um, proof against um, scams. It was not a nice word that he used. But, but it is true that if you can't trust each other, then you can't trust each other's judgments. And if we can't make judgments and are limited to only the things we can prove by the numbers, we're very limited in what we can do. And you know, when, when I said that a lot of this is in our hands, I guess restoring trust in each other and in our government and in uh, our institutions is not something that is going to be easily done by the people in this room like all the other things I said. <laughs> but I, I think you're absolutely right that it's very, very fundamental to what we're talking about. Interesting. Rutledge? So Lee knows this from our previous conversations, but I think building off your point about it's hard to, to trust each other's judgments um, is part of what makes us want to rely on evidence, and yet I think that's a fallacy um, because whatever evidence you're looking at, randomized control trials have judgment in them. They have judgment in them in who you pick, where, where you decide to operate, what uh, components you pick, what you set as your statistical significance level, whether that statistical significance has any poly policy, revel bleh, policy relevance, uh, or impact on people's lives, all of those are value judgments that we, that policymakers, practitioners, advocates have to make, um, regardless of what the numbers tell us. And so, I, you know, you know, this is my drumbeat that this doesn't take away value judgment. It helps inform it, but we ultimately have to make value judgments. And I, I don't know if that resonates with you in terms of your discussion about the trust in, in government. But I think you would agree that when you get a number that the cost effectiveness of this particular program is uh, 17 to 1, that's, all, I'll tell you a little story. When I, um, w I was with the poverty program when it began, and the Department of um, it was uh, evaluation and planning, I guess it was called, was peopled almost entirely by people who came over from the Defense Department. They were the McNamara Whiz kids. And so they were doing only numbers. And the head of the department, uh, Don Kershaw, made a presentation to the staff. And he said, you know, there's really only one program of all the ones we're trying that has a really good cost-effectiveness ratio, and that is the family planning program. And it has a cost-effective ratio, uh, cost-effectiveness ratio of 17 to 1. Well, that was pretty impressive, and uh, Sergeant Driver said, would you mind making your presentation this Saturday at my home? And when Don Kershaw arrived at the Shriver home, there was Mrs. Shriver flanked by two monsignors in full clerical <laughs> regalia. He gave his presentation and ended up with, you know, it's 17 to 1. 
Um, in I, to I told this story in my first book, which um, which I wrote with my husband, and he added a sentence in his profile in Courage. Sergeant Shriver actually continued the family planning program, and it was the first federal program that provided family planning funds uh, that were earmarked. The others were all in the maternal and child health program, for instance, were sort of under, under the door, under the carpet. But um, I wouldn't for a moment underestimate the value of 17 to 1. It's just that you can't judge everything that way. And there's a bias between what you can judge that way and what you can't judge that way. And that, I think, is what is most worrisome. Yes. I, I really, really enjoyed your uh, talk in the paper. Um, I hope during the course of our conversations, we don't miss the brewing mistrust of communities for philanthropy who are pushing evidence-based practices. Mm. It was the distrust that, um, as you, each of these stories you uh, allude to, there's there's a, a body of knowledge in communities. There's there's real people who are subjects, if you will. And oftentimes the providers and the, um, the community members who are uh, at, found, at nonprofits, um, even some who have researchers, they're questioning the, the efficacy of evidence-based practice as the only um, route, particularly the, the experimental notion. So at some point, if you think through the discussion around distrust, the end user is growing even more distrustful of um, interventions that are being, as they perceive, pushed on them only because they're evidence based. So, this notion that innovation is starved, um, their voice is not heard, and particularly for marginalized communities of underserved, underrepresented people, the question becomes does the sample of which um, the evidence is drawn upon look like us? I mean, that. I hear that time and time and time again. So that, I think that's something, if we talk about the stress, it's not just government, but it's all those systems who are proxies for government that we actually think, have to think about. Uh, I have two comments. One is on uh, your last point, that it is true that the research has been done primarily on people who are easier to research. They don't move around as much, they're easier to get hold of, and so on. Uh, so that's one way of, of ske skewing that has occurred. But the other comment I want to make is the suggestion we make in our paper about trying to figure out what are the essential components of what seems to work, as opposed to the models that work, I think give communities a lot more opportunity to make their own judgments about, yes, yeah, so this is an evidence-based practice that we, from our own experience, can really relate to, whereas this other part, not so much. If you get a model, you can't make those judgments. If you get a set of factors, of components, uh, you can do a lot more to shape it to the needs of this community today here. Anne? Um, uh, well, first of all, Lee and Frank, congratulations on a terrific paper, a very important one. Um, I wanted to just ask whether your message is, whether you differentiate your message um, according to audience, uh, and particularly according to audience that um, is involved in the sponsoring of the research. Is it a different message, or do you expect different reactions from the public sector, from the philanthropic sector, and from the research academic sector? Do, do one of the, do any one of those sectors have more ability to act on these recommendations, are some more constrained, or is, are you making this recommendation across the board? Frank, do you want to talk about that? <laughs> uh, 
Dan is asking whether we are differentiating in what we're recommending in terms of our audiences of philanthropists, the public sector, and the researchers. Mm -hmm. And whether we expect them to act differently and whether they each have different capacity to act on this general message of a more inclusive knowledge base. Have I said it about right? Yeah, we, we actually went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth on this, on the roles, which I think the ultimate answer is no, but I think we ended up thinking people could play different roles in building the balance between evidence, acting on evidence, and pushing innovation in the future. So I think we'll hear, actually, uh, a little bit later in philanthropy where more and more people are guided by evidence, a broader range of evidence in terms of investments. But I think, and I think some of my colleagues here think, philanthropy has a particular responsibility to push innovation and find new ways of measuring. Um, yeah, I, the example that comes to my mind from my experience is in the community change field where there is no doubt that evidence-based practices make a big difference programmatically in what people can do. And people turn to those, they can rely on them, it gets them started programmatically. They embed that in a much in a very complex web of community relationships, of alliances and partnerships that come together to pursue results, to get the developmental outcomes one wants for children. You have to not just do a program, you have to sequence programs, you have to put them together with informal supports. It's that broader web and figuring out how we are going to develop evidence around what works there that I think we're about. I think philanthropy is ideally positioned to do some of that. You would hope government can turn to that even more. I think Promise Neighborhoods actually does. When you look at what Promise is doing, it's doing a lot of that. But government, as Lee has suggested, is in a very tricky position of how much of that broader experimentation can be supported and how much do you have to keep being able to say, we need to be very rigorous about the things we can measure. I happen to think Promise is making a really shrewd, savvy blend of those. Um, so to me, it isn't the, is the message different to the different sectors? It's um, are there different potential roles given the pressures on each of those sectors? And I don't know if that came close to answering your question. But. One more comment, one more question. All right, Deb. And a microphone is approaching from the back. There you go. You know, I wonder as I think about people being comfortable with different levels of evidence, if it also is a part about looking for some certainty that I'm making the right decision. And that there is this illusion that if I have a randomized trial, I'll be certain and I have no risk. And in some ways, maybe the research community has done a disservice to ourselves by somehow promoting that we're taking the, all the risk away. Just follow the data, and the data will lead you to the promised land. And in truth, there's risk in every study you do, and there's risk in every policy decision you make. So I don't know if that's part of the framework you want to promote, too, is that we all need to be recognize there's risk, and two, be open to the realization that someone may teach you something. It is possible that you don't know everything there is to know. And I worry that there are people that enter into debates not to learn, but to simply convince you that you're wrong. And no amount of data, I really, I mean, I want to echo what Rut Rutledge said. I think if you're disinclined to support services for children because you think it's a private family issue and government has no business in it, I don't care what kind of data you show up with on the doorstep. I, I don't think it's going to happen. But I think your point about there is no no risk avenue to the holy land uh, is very important. And Frank and I agreed 
that we would feel free to make a few additions to our paper here and there uh, after hearing from everybody here. And I think that's a very important point that is not really explicit in our paper and, and ought to be. Carol, is there else? We'll do two more. Have, Thank I, you. There's Richard also. Uh, I think it's important when you add to your paper to acknowledge that the research and evaluation community is also struggling with this question. I mean, I actually don't think, um, I know very few evaluators who, who end their evaluation study by saying, and this is the answer forever and always. The mm -hmm. typical way of answering any research or ending any research study is to say, and here are the six more things that we still need to understand and and look at more deeply. So I think, you know, we shouldn't paint this as a sort of black and white thing. I mean, I think there is a lot of work going on right now in the evaluation community to ask these kinds of questions. Um, so let's, I, I think that's, that's that good. would be a fruitful that's area good. to explore. That's good. Great. Quick comment that one of the reasons why we don't really know the risk of implementing um, gold standard programs is because we don't register those programs when they're those trials when they're being tried, as the NIH is now requiring, so that we know whether or not they succeeded. So we have no real, we have a big file drawer problem, and um, I don't know how many times MST has been implemented that it didn't work, or um, any of the other gold standard programs, and that's something that we could work on, is trying to make sure that if we fund programs, we make sure that if they don't succeed, or they don't succeed at the same level that the original program succeeded, that we are collecting that information. A great suggestion. That's the beginning point of many other suggestions that we hope will come from the conversation today. We'd like to take now just a 15 minute break and then come back in time for the next panel. I'd like to just offer everybody one more chance to say thank you to Frank and Lee for their work. <laughs>